morning, everyone. It is really cool to be in this really beautiful room. I feel like a pair of brown shoes in a tuxedo shop. So. And I'm wearing my jacket uh, because uh, I'm, I'm still a little emotionally scarred from exactly how cold and windy it was the last time I was here. <laughs> uh, if you have a Bible, please open it to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, if you don't have a Bible, look on your device. And if you're already looking on your vi- device, please close your social media apps and pay attention for goodness sakes. Um. <laughs> We could do the altar call right there just for that. Would that be all right? (laughs) 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For those of you that are studying the New Testament, you may know that this is a really interesting and important part of Paul's letter to the Corinthians because in it he's quoting what is essentially song lyrics, a poem, a hymn, if you like, that they would have already known that predates one of the earliest letters in the New Testament. Here's what he says. Now I would remind you, brothers... Of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, in our time together, would you come and speak to us? Lord, I'm sure that the regularity of chapel and the regularity of being a student at Gordon can sort of anesthetize the mind and the soul to really powerful transformation in these moments. And so, God, would you... Uh, disrupt us, interrupt us, get our attention this morning so that you, Holy Spirit, can speak to us even today at a chapel at Gordon College. Lord, let the words of my mouth please you. And would you open the ears and the minds and the hearts of those that hear them so that they might know Jesus and love Jesus. Amen. So, About 20 years ago, which feels really weird for me to say because I don't feel as old as I am becoming, about 20 years ago, I was sitting in a building not terribly dissimilar to to this. And and in the building not terribly dissimilar to this, I I just graduated college. I was highly motivated because I met met the woman who had become my wife when I was 15. She was 16. We met in high school. Um, And uh, and I just knew that I knew that I knew that I I wanted to marry her. And so my parents, they had really recently become a Christian. And and I'd I'd really, really recently become, like, aware that Christians are meant to honor their parents. And I was like, oh, man. Um, You know, when Jesus teaches you something and you're like, oh, that's not what I wanted to learn. (laughs) So I was really trying to honor my parents at this point in my life, and, and so I, I told my parents, hey, you know, I, I am super serious about this girl named Hope, and they were like, cool, just graduate college, and I was like, see, I'm not a very patient man, okay, and, I, and that hasn't gotten any better with the years, so I was like, you want me to graduate college, challenge accepted. So I ended up shoving my four-year degree into two years, graduating very early, and marrying my wife a week later. <laughs> um, some of you that are in serious relationships right now, if you just got a weird side eye from your future spouse, like, hey, he did, you want to know what's your, just, just take your lumps. Uh, so I, at 20, walked down the aisle a week after I'd gotten my, my uh, bachelor's degree, and, and my wife and I, man, we had, we had a plan. Um, see, I studied music, and so did she, and so the, the goal was that we wanted to teach music at a college, not, not unlike this. And, uh, and so she was going to graduate school, and I was working, and, and we were volunteering with the campus ministry there in, in, our, in our church. And so we were, we were at a conference because my campus minister, who is now my friend, was like, hey, do you want to go to this conference? And I think we were supposed to help people, but I was young, married, poor, and he offered to take me somewhere for free. So I was just like, yes. And I was sitting on this side of the room, and a gentleman got up, and he gave, a, um, he gave an announcement. It wasn't even a sermon. He gave an announcement. Hey, we're going to plant this church in Scotland. If you're interested in that, 
come and talk to us. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to stop what you're doing and go and do that. And so I, being very obedient, was like, no. <laughs> no. Because, um, like, I just got married, and, like, we just, like, put pictures on the wall, and, like, I had a plan, you know? Some of you, you're here, and you've got a plan. You're like, yeah, I'm going to get my degree, and then I'm going to go and do the thing that I want to go and do. That's my plan. And I had one of those. And so we got back to the hotel that night, and my wife and I, we were chatting, and she said, you know, the weirdest thing happened today. I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? And that guy got up and started talking about Scala, and it was like the Holy Spirit said we should stop what we're doing. And I was like, uh, okay. And those of you gentlemen who've been married for a while know that God's voice sounds an awful lot like your wife's voice, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I was like, all right, let's do it. And so we said yes. We said yes to Jesus. We said yes to, you know, uh, we, we had a baby. We had the first grandchild, and so we, we thought just to, you know, have good relationships with her grandparents, our parents, we would take their first grandchild across an ocean when she was three months old. They loved that. But I'll tell you this. Since saying yes to Jesus, not because I've done everything perfectly, I most certainly have not, he has not ceased to be faithful to me. And, I, and I'm, I'm honing in on saying yes to Jesus because you've been in this teaching series about joy, right? I love the book of Philippians. It is filled with this theme, as I'm sure you are learning and will continue to learn. I hope you love the book of Philippians. But if there's one thing that I want you to get from me this morning, it's this, that joy in Jesus demands, requires full submission to the gospel of Jesus. Joy in Jesus. If you really want joy, not happiness, not situational positivity, I mean joy, that water that's from a deeper aquifer than the little bubbling streams of your own situation. If you want joy, that only comes to the degree to which you are fully submitted to the gospel of Jesus. And that's really what Paul was trying to say to these Corinthians. Paul had been in correspondence with the church in Corinth, um, and, and we're not really sure how many letters he'd received or how many you know, he'd written. There, there's some debate about that. But at some point, he's writing this letter because the church in Corinth was crazy. They're crazy. People were coming and taking communion and, and getting drunk at communion. Do you know how long you have to take communion? It's tiny little cups. It was crazy. And so Paul's answer to them wasn't, hey, stop that. Paul's answer to them wasn't, hey, clean up your act. Paul's answer to them wasn't even, look, I'm coming back to give you a whooping. It wasn't any of that. It was, okay, look, every one of the issues that you're experiencing, the answer is full submission to the gospel of Jesus. And so there's this, there's this literary pattern in the book of 1 Corinthians where he deals with a problem and the answer is the gospel. And he deals with another problem and the answer is the gospel. And he does this over and over again until it sort of culminates in chapter 15 when he says, look, I just... Just to summarize, let me remind you of the thing that is of first importance if you actually heard it from me when I said it to you the first time, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. If you want joy, if the Corinthians wanted joy, then there wasn't a way to get that apart from full submission to the gospel. Some of you are here for different reasons. Some of you are here because you're on a visitation day. Welcome to Gordon College. If this goes really well and you like it, this is an awesome place. If you don't like what I'm preaching, I'm a guest speaker and it's never like it. Um. <laughs> Others of you are here because you really love Jesus. And you're like, man, I want to be at a place that's going to prepare me to serve and follow Christ for the rest of my life. And some of you are here because you think you're a Christian you act in sort of Christian ways. You're pretty sure your parents were Christians, and they were pretty excited about you going to Christian colleges, and so you thought you'd go here. But as you're here, you're really not sure what you think. You're really not sure what you believe. I am here to tell you, if you want joy, joy that endures suffering, joy that endures heartache, joy that explains all the good things in life, and joy that actually can get you through all of the really difficult things that you haven't experienced yet because you're not old enough. 
You want joy? That requires full submission to Jesus. Now, if you want happiness, that's a different matter entirely. Happiness, that's pretty easy. We have medications for that. We have food for that. If you're me, you have pints of ice cream for that. Happiness is simple. All you require to be happy is a consistent hit of dopamine from the dumbest part and oldest part of your brain, which is why the neurobiologist who created the apps on your phone gave you that little red dot, because every time you touch it, guess what you get hit with? Dopamine, which is why most of you are still looking at your phone. Pay attention. He's sitting here saying, I want to remind you, brothers, the word is Adelphoi, it's brothers and sisters, it's everybody, of the gospel that I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved. Did you hear the tense of that? Not which you have been saved and now you're good. By which you are being saved. You need to know that when you come to faith in Jesus, you don't get saved and then go about your day. You have been, are being, and will be saved. Salvation is an all of life experience, my friends. And if you really want to experience the joy of your salvation, then that means you've got to go deeper in your understanding of and submission to the gospel of Jesus because it's all about Jesus. Praise God it's not all about you. Because have you met you? I mean, you're great. And I know that like your guidance counselor told you you could be anything and he had the cat poster and told you just hang in there. Like I know that. But listen, nobody's lied to you more than you. Nobody has been more dishonest with you than you. Nobody has led your life more poorly than you. And we live in a current cultural moment that says, if you really want to be joyful, if you really want to be happy, don't just follow your own heart. Spend your time mining the depths of your own experience. Figure out at the deepest possible level who you are and what makes you feel happy. And then the way to be happy out into the world is to to take that and express it as some form of identity. That's how you are happy. That's how you have joy. And that, my friends, is a lie. It's a lie. It takes a while to figure out that it's a lie because for a minute, it actually works. For a minute, it feels pretty good. For a minute, for a season, for a decade, maybe two. But eventually, you run out of the awesome feeling because you are not a sufficient grounding of your own existence and you're not a sufficient source of your own joy. You were made for God. Paul knew that about the Corinthians, which is why he said, remember the gospel. So what is this gospel? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the heart. That is the central message of the gospel. That Christ died for your sins. Friends, if you want full joy in Jesus, it requires full submission to this gospel. Because without full submission to this gospel, you cannot be saved from your sins. It's not particularly popular to say, and it's definitely not going to be found in any church growth textbooks, but I'll say it because I get to get in my car and go home after this. If you don't submit your life to Jesus Christ, when you die, you will spend eternity apart from him. Your sins make you an enemy to God, both by nature and by choice. Now, our culture says that to say that to people is hateful, but that's not true. It's actually hateful not to. By not saying that, what I'm really saying is I actually prefer my own emotional comfort and the avoidance of a feeling of, you know, discongruity with my culture by not telling you that. So I'm just going to not tell you that and, you know, Christians will just be nice people. Have you met Jesus? He was not often nice. He was kind, but he did not often say nice things. And so Paul is willing to to tell these people, look, I've... I've got to remind you of the most important thing, that Christ died for your sins because he had to die for your sins. Moreover, he didn't just die for them and stay in the ground. He died for them and rose up three days later, conquering sin, Satan, death, demons, hell, the grave, and all of their works and effects in every area of society. And one day he will return again after the faithful proclamation of this news to every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And that's why this college exists. That little Greek phrase that many of you probably can't read on your seal, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's what it means. Savior. Savior means that we have to be saved from something. Not, not life maker better-er. You know, he's not like the sriracha on your, the meal of your life, though sriracha does make everything better. 
That's in the Bible. It's in the book of Hesitations. <laughs> I suppose that's sort of my point, because I think if I have my biggest, like my, if I were to just be most honest with you in our final moments together, my biggest fear for you is not your emotionality toward God. I am not afraid of your generation not feeling very strongly toward God. Listen to the songs we sing. They're passion-filled songs. What I'm afraid of is that you are going to emote toward a God who isn't there, that you have strong feelings about a Jesus who isn't the Jesus of the scriptures, that we have taught you, we've discipled you to feel great feelings toward a God who, if you were to describe him, God would not recognize himself in your description. I gotta be honest, for the long term, I'm, emotions are really important, they really are. And, and they matter, and, but they're really only good at telling you how you feel. They're not really good at telling you what is true. They're really, really not good at telling you what is true about God. They're a really bad way to interpret the scriptures. They're just a really good way to tell you how you feel. But we live in a current cultural moment that says the only way to know what is really true is to figure out what makes you feel the best, what makes you feel the strongest, that with which you can most faithfully identify, and then to go and live that as if it were true. But my friends, my Bible says that your heart is sick and hard and that you need a new one. Ah! You have got a little liar living in your chest trying to kill you. But, but Jesus wants you to have joy. Joy. Joy that's still there in the bad diagnosis. Joy that's still there when you get laid off. Joy that's still there when your parents are no longer together. Joy that's still there when something really bad happens. Joy that's so deep that when you're unhappy, you are unshakable because you have joy. And that only comes as you fully submit to the gospel of Jesus. Now, I get that submit is not a very popular word these days. We want to have a conversation. We want to have a dialogue. Right? We want to be heard. We want to deconstruct. And that's fine to do with each other. But my friends, when God speaks, all of heaven is silent. The book of Ecclesiastes says, you are God in heaven. While I'm on earth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my words be few. While you're here at this college, God is speaking to you through your professors who love you and pray for you. I mean, I know many of them. They do, in fact, love you and pray for you. God is speaking to you through some of your students. God is speaking to you through what happens on this stage. And everything is, is uniting together to be different parts in the symphony of the mission of this college, which is to tell you that Jesus Christ lived for you died for you, and on the third day rose again for you. And if you want to have true joy, then that is only found in full submission to the gospel of Jesus. So, earlier on I said, right, I, I know what it's like to sit where you're sitting, because I have sat where you're sitting. I know what it's like to really love Jesus and want to grow with him. And I also know what it's like to be pretty cynical and to walk out of rooms like this and forget what happened in them immediately after I left. And so my great hope here isn't that I've said something interesting to you. My great hope here is that through the foolishness of something that I've said to you, God is speaking to you. And that maybe, just maybe, on your way to your next class, you'll do business with the Lord because he loves you, man. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I can't figure it out. If I were God, I wouldn't love me. But God loves you, and he deeply desires your joy. And he has given you this good story of Jesus, that as you come under that story, you will, in fact, have it. Father, would you bless and protect my friends in this room? Lord, some of these men and women, they, they just love you. They, they're here because they love you and they want to grow in you. That's amazing. God, would you show them in how they can deepen their joy in you. Lord, some people, Lord, they're just kind of on the fence and they're figuring out their lives and their faith. God, I'm so glad they're here at this place at this time. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them the depth of your joy to be found in Jesus as they trust him and they serve him with everything that they've got. Lord, let our devotion to you go beyond mere emotions about you to full and faithful submission to the gospel. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.